Okay, this is part nine of Universal Hiker, September 20th, 2014. Final update. Well, the long walk is finally done. Handbrake and I came upon the Canadian border on September 16th at 1010 in the morning. We have been incredibly fortunate this year to have such good hiking weather. We heard some streams that we hopped across this year were waist deep last year. I encountered only about four to five days of rain and two days of snow. There was only a week's worth of weather that was very hot. I began April 23rd at the Mexican border and finished in not quite five months at the Canadian border. I took 16 zero or days off, went through four pairs of trail runners, saw two bears, one had just been shot since hunting season had just opened in Washington, saw six rattlesnakes and many other kinds of uh, snakes, saw many deer, two bald eagles, a number of hawks, a coyote, lots of grouse and osprey, many types of squirrels, and many other types of critters. The flora was wide and varied. There were many, many types of interesting mushrooms in northern Washington forests. There were glaciers and active volcanoes up north. Handbrake went eight miles north into Manning Park, Canada to meet his wife. Since I had lost my passport, I had to hike back 30 miles into Washington to catch a hitch. Another hiker, John, was going into town near Seattle to rent a car and drive to Oakland. He invited me along and had avoided a long bus ride back home. I very much enjoyed being outdoors and seeing all the eco zones. Even more, I enjoyed meeting new people and hearing about their lifestyle choices. I hope to never again be locked into just one way of living life. Looking through each person's perspective gave me a broader view of life. It was different from reading about it or seeing it on TV or in the movies. I was there with that person and experiencing their life through conversation or model. It was probably the fact that we were all working from the same level and sharing from similar experiences. No one really cared if you were rich or poor had a job or not, or what your past was. It was more about living in the moment, surviving another day, and being respectful of each other. For many, they have been conditioned to think that there is only one way to live. This extended walk into the wilderness has shown me we have more choices than we think. If we are stuck, there is always a way out. To me, the adventure is stepping out of our comfort zone into what we perceive as a better path. I enjoyed visiting with you throughout the hike. By the way, yard sale returned home a couple of weeks before me to start school. He also had his adventures and was happy about his choice not to through hike, but spend more time in each selected area. It was a great way for father and son to spend time together since we did do around 800 miles together. Landslide. These were the trail updates. There are a variety of reasons why through hikers leave the trail. For some, it was not what they expected. A nice walk in the mountains, it's not. As Handbrake's father, who, met, who we met in Sierra City, put it, it is pure torture. It can be that for long periods of time, then you might have stretches where your pack is fitting just right with most of the food and water weight gone and you're going through a beautiful country in perfect weather. Most rookie hikers, as we were, can't imagine the weather extremes for one. You can start off the day on top of a mountain in below freezing temperatures, post holing through snow, but by the end of the day be in 90 degrees temperature walking through the desert. 
Well, there are a number of people who died on the trail each year. <laughs> when we hiked in 2014, the two known casualties were a young man in the first 17 miles who died of heat stroke because he didn't bring enough water. And he had been partying the night before in ecstasy. And a hiker who died in a flash flood in Oregon. According to records, most deaths occur in river crossings. And high uh, descents and mountains are a major constant through the trail. For some, it is just too brutal to be doing this for five to six months. Many people develop blisters, shin splints, stress fract fractures, and other foot and leg related, related injuries. Many get bored and start missing their families or comforts of home. Sometimes weather stops the best of experienced hikers. Snow conditions in the Sierras, Cascades, and even the Southern California range can be impassable. Detours because of flooding, landslides, or fire can cause delays. There are also levels, years, or rivers where the, where the rivers are raging and very cold. Hypothermia is always a danger, especially in prolonged periods of rain and snow conditions. Falling or slipping down mountains in snowy conditions is prevalent. With all this, though, the trail is a wonderful teaching tool. It tests one's grit and purpose, and if one comes out of it, they have usually learned a lot about themselves and gained a lot of confidence in what they can do and endure. Most people that come into the new presentation have some kind of preconceived idea of what it is. This has to be let go of whatever it is. Otherwise, they won't get very far. Just like on the trail, you have to face everything that comes along, no matter what you believe, hope, or wish for. When reality sets in about survival, it gets real. You can always get off the trail, and many hikers do. You cannot face yourself and go back into your personal self-comfort zone, and most people do. It was never an option for me because I saw that there is nothing there in the personal self that goes anywhere. I would rather face hell than go back into an empty, meaningless nothingness. Look at people's lives. They go through each lifetime quickly with a few thrills in between. Each lifetime is a speck in the overall picture of our awareness of waking up. It makes sense to have gratitude for every moment you have an opportunity to wake up to something more. This is a journey like no other. It is your journey to have fun with. On the trail, trying to share Ekankar with other hikers didn't fit in at all. Being out in nature and bringing Ekankar ideas to that environment seemed foreign. I didn't discuss it much. The most I did was leave little hue cards in town stops describing this chant and its so-called benefits. With what Duane is presenting, discussing the environment and what's going on with it fits right into a hike. We can begin with what's going on with nature and the planet and then move into what's going on within the individual and also other dimensions and levels of existence once the person is ready to hear something like this. During much of the hike, I would chant the word for Ekankar's inner master, Mahanta. During periods of extreme fatigue, crossing a raging river or traversing a steep snowy slope, I would seek solace in this idea that there is someone watching over me. After many sketchy moments of nearly slipping off a cliff or tripping in the river rapids, I made the conclusion that no one is going to save me but me. Being in a survival situation clears away much of the ideas one has about life, especially the ones that don't apply to survival. What Duane has done is clear the baggage mankind has had with masters, gurus, and spiritual paths. For those who still rely on them, it's fine, but for those wanting to see more, the information is now available. The knowledge won't be around for that long since the dark forces have a way of getting agreement 
from this world to swallow and distort everything that makes sense. I enjoy following a few of each year's PCT hikers and their blogs until I get back on the trail again for a longer trek. That may never come, though, since the priority are the humanitarian projects Duane has set up to counter the destruction of the world. Earth is turning into another lifeless Mars and people are just business as usual. A few of us in the new presentation, our 501c3 foundation, are doing what we can to wake people up. When people hear this, most of them say, I am awake. If they were awake, why would they still be consciously and unconsciously agreeing to the demise of the planet? In addition, we are talking about waking up to more than this one dimension and then go on to wake up to one's real awareness. It's an ongoing process that never stops unless one becomes self-convinced of a certain position. I am the universal hiker, but you may have noticed in my last PCT update, I ended it with my trail name, Landslide. Most through hikers have a trail name that is characteristic of them in some way. It is protocol to let other hikers christen your na trail name. For me, it was the descent from Mount Baden-Powell, mile 400. I slipped on some loose, loose rocks and went barreling down the hill with the rocks in front of me and behind me. A hiker who had seen me fall before called out, hey, landslide, and that was my name for the rest of the journey. I may have fallen maybe 12 times in the five months of hiking, and two of those times were face falls with no hands to catch me. In one of those face falls, I slipped over a hidden route and didn't have time to brace my fall. Fortunately, it was a dusty trail. That's why I didn't see the route. So the landing was cushioned, but I got a bloody nose anyway. Along with the sweat and dust on my face, I looked pretty gnarly. Handbrake, my hiking partner during that stretch, asked me if I was okay. I said yes, and he immediately pulled out his camera to take some shots for memories. Handbrake, who was a few years younger than my 64 years, is from Sisters, Oregon. He got his trail name from the way he holds his trekking poles. From behind, it looks like he is putting on the brakes. He was instrumental in getting me to the Canadian border. And I have much gratitude for his company during the journey. You can see from Yard Sales, July 18, 2014 post, another reason to get off the trail. He wanted to slow down and spend some time with nature. I can see his view because much of the time I felt like I was on a freeway. Nature's freeway, but having a mileage mindset is different than slowing down to explore. Most people today are on life's freeway, fast lane, going nowhere until they wear out, get sick, and pass on. Nobody hardly knows where they are going. This hike washed away a lot of attitudes for me. I let go of baggage in the form of ideas I no longer needed. The beginning Southern California section was so difficult, I was amazed my body had it in it to carry on every day for 20 miles in cold, hot, windy, rugged terrain, climbing up and down, around, continu continual switchbacks. We would climb 4,000 feet only to descend 5,000 feet and climb to 8,000 feet and so on, day after day. We were often hungry and exhausted. There were, of course, many days when you felt great. The backpack fit just right, and the weather and the scenery were outstanding. Other days, you just couldn't adjust the pack to any kind of comfort level. You had pains, the weather was miserable, the terrain was rocky or slippery. 700 miles of Southern California desert and the mountains led us to Kennedy Meadows South. This is the official starting point for hikers entering the high Sierras. We entered the Sierras and soon came to the cutoff to Mount Whitney, which is the highest point in the contiguous United States at 14,500 feet. 
It's a side trip off the PCT, but many hikers take the trail up just to see the view and say they had climbed it. After I returned from my five-month hiking trip in September of 2014, I saw things differently. I was single and had little possessions. The cottage I had been staying in before I left on the hike and returned to seemed claustrophobic compared to the great outdoors. I decided to let the cottage go and sleep outdoors like a homeless person. I had always been kind of envious of their lifestyle in a strange kind of way. Not the uncomfortable part, but the part about the freedom from society. Strings are still attached, of course, but a lot less attention has to be placed on maintaining the modern conveniences. I still had my truck and business to come back to. My helper had done a good job keeping my gardening route in running order. I returned to my garden maintenance business during the day, worked on the computer at restaurants in the evening, and slept in the bushes at night. The hike ended September 16th, 2014, and I came on my first Skype meeting with Duane at the end of November of the same year. One of my old ex friends invited me to the meeting, plus Duane and I had been corresponding off and on. My first impression was that he was acting like a mini master, one of those Ekankar offshoot fellows. That night, I tried singing the new you before bed, and as suggested, and when I woke up, something had shifted. I didn't have any dreams that night, but the morning brought a profound, you could say, difference in my awareness. I came on the following day's Skype meeting and listened intently to how and what Duane was saying. This fellow was making a lot of sense. Just by what he saw and shared made the old words of wisdom seem dull and uninteresting. His viewpoint was fresh and pure, and he articulated it well. There were a few moments of doubt in the next couple of weeks. We had daily Skype calls during those days. It was the same when I switched over to Ekankar 40 years ago from Christianity. There were some lingering doubts like, am I doing the right thing? One night on the real side, I even asked Paul Twitchell, what do you think of Duane? Paul looked at me and turned into a kind of wolf man with hair all over his face and an expression that told me, get real. I haven't had any doubts since then because when I look at what's offered in our daily life of society, there's nothing out there worth considering. All money, fame, wisdoms, loves, truths, really nothing that comes close to this wonderful reality of the isness once you begin to recognize it. I would attend the daily Skype meetings and gradually started sharing the knowledge and awareness I had come across. And that's where I'll end today. Thank you for listening.